My name is Teresa Scandiffio. I'm the Director of Adult Learning here, and we are very excited for tonight, today's event uh, with Rick Perlinger. I'm going to stick to the script so I don't go off, so we have lots of time. We're thrilled to welcome you to our second event of this higher learning season, and the third event as part of the Real Heritage Initiative. In addition to those joining us in person, we have many others across Canada and internationally joining us via live stream. Hello, world. Thank you all for your support of the Higher Learning Program. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris and Visa, our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We'd also like to thank donors and members like you for supporting TIFF's charitable mission of bringing the power of film to life 365 days a year. So a few reminders, we ask that you please place your phones on silent. No photo or video taking is permitted during the event. We have professional cameras doing so for us. And the video will be made available on Higher Learning Digital Resource Hub. That's tiff.net slash higher learning. During the question and answer, we ask that you please wait for the microphone to reach you before asking your question. We'll also be taking questions for Rick via Twitter. You can submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag RealHeritage. That's for the people live streaming. You can put your hands up. Today's event, Rick Prellinger on the Future of Memory, is part of our Real Heritage Initiative, an ongoing series of educational sessions dedicated to the access and management of moving image collections in Ontario and beyond. Through panel discussions, workshops, film screenings, and networking sessions, the Real Heritage Program brings together scholars, archivists, filmmakers, curators, and post-secondary students and faculty to examine the opportunities and challenges faced by both large moving image collections and small repositories, such as those found in regional archives and small libraries. The Real Heritage Program is supported by the Government of Ontario and the Ontario Trillium Foundation. As well, we're happy to announce that we're now accepting applications for the Jeffrey and Sandra Lyons Canadian Film Scholarship, which provides a graduate student an opportunity to use um, TIFF's Film Reference Library resources to support their research. The deadline for the 2015 call for applications is November 20th. More information, including eligibility, can be found at tiff.net slash careers. Don't miss this opportunity. It's a fantastic moment for students to have a wealth of information that, you know, mine all of these amazing resources, come up with incredible projects for within or outside academia. Don't miss it. All you nerds out there, you know what I'm saying? Kid in a candy store. Finally, I want to let you know about our next higher learning event, Uncovering Warhol, on November 6th. As part of our Andy Warhol Roundtables and Talks series, alongside the major exhibition and film program, this opening panel will feature curators from the Andy Warhol Museum and the Andy Warhol Film Project at the Whitney Museum of American Art, alongside curator John Davies, who's done an amazing job curating this program. To learn more, please visit tiff.net slash higher learning. I promise I will not direct you to more website links. I'm now going to direct you to our fantastic director of film reference library, Sylvia Frank, who will set up today's conversation. Oops. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm the director of the Film Reference Library, the, uh, which has a fabulous collection, um, and it's on the fourth floor of this building. If you've not visited, please do so. We're open today at uh, 12 noon. Our role is to advance film scholarship through our extensive collections and staff expertise. Uh, some of you have may already maybe made use of the collections. We have Adam McGoyan's papers, David Cronenberg, Bruce McDonald, Patricia Rosema, just to name a few. We're also the uh, holders of a very extensive film collection. And for UNESCO World Heritage Day, World Day for Audiovisual Heritage, um, we're doing a program called Real Film Love. <laughs> and we're going to bring in some of our very ephemeral films. And they've been chosen by the staff. So that's October 27th in the evening, 6 PM, if you'd like to join us. Um, we also have a, an exhibition that I curated, again on the fourth floor, and it highlights three of our archival exhibitions. It's called In Love with the Stars, and it's a different take on celebrity, um, and it's really to complement the Warhol um, exhibition. There's a lot of kind of synergies between the two uh, shows, so I do hope you visit. And we're hoping to launch our online database very soon. 
possibly next week, so keep your ears open and look at Twitter and all of that. Um, but my real pleasure today is introducing Rick Prellinger. I hear, heard Rick talk at the uh, Congress of uh, International Film Archives this year, um, but I've heard him speak before, um, probably about 15 years ago, and I've kind of followed his career. He's always fascinated me. Um, we were just talking about how people think of him as being the Internet Archive, um, and actually he's not. Uh, <laughs> but, of course, that brings up the whole issue of the digital world. Um, he's a very interesting speaker, and uh, today I think he'll, I'm hoping you'll see where his path has taken him to the present. He founded the Prelinger Archives in 1982. Um, it's a collection of 60,000 advertising, educational, industrial, and amateur films, and it's now held at the Library of Congress. He's a board member of the Internet Archive, and he sat on the U.S. National Film Preservation Board from 2001 to 2004. In 2000, he collaborated with the Internet Archive to build an open access, freely downloadable digital moving image collection that now totals over 6,500 titles. He's made 17 urban history compilation films and two experimental feature films that have played at venues around the world. He's currently a professor of film and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I wish I was one of his students. Anyway, without further ado, Rick Prelinger. Thank um, thanks to both of you, and thanks to, uh, to all of you. Oh, good, for coming. Um, is it okay to encourage people to tweet? Uh, you know, the one of the great things about the archives and library and sort of future of knowledge worlds is that Twitter is like a free university education without any evaluation. I don't know, it's um, a lot of great ideas get passed forth, so I'd encourage you to um, use it. Let me just, uh, um, so let me begin by thanking you for, um, first off, making this visit possible and for your hospitality and warmth. It's a, a super great privilege to speak here. Um, I'm going to take just a minute to specify the position from which I'm speaking. Do I identify as an archivist? I don't know. I'm not an institutional archivist. I primarily collect home movies, and I try to propagate archival materials to the world. I touch film as often as I can, but I ha haven't had the um, socialization or the training that most archivists have. I spend more of my time thinking about the history and the future of archives and cultural materials, so I tend to think that the term meta-archivist is perhaps more descriptive. Starting in late 2000, I had the good fortune to join with Internet Archive to build this freely downloadable online collection that Sylvia mentioned, and the opportunity to provide a fairly high degree of access to the materials that I'd collected was life-changing. The Internet Archive project turned me into a collaborator with many hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world, uh, many of whom I'll never meet, although sometimes I meet them in airports and other strange places. Um, and maybe even more important, it helped enable the production of thousands upon thousands of derivative works. No one will ever know how many derivative works have used this collection. Being able to give away pictures and sounds and data is a highly privileged position. As Brewster Kale says, you can go broke giving things away. And because of this partnership, I haven't gone broke giving things away. But giving things away has caused me to think somewhat differently about archives and about access to the cultural heritage than many other people do. I don't take archival workflow for granted. And I'm not sure I take archives as we know them for granted. So when I use the term we to speak of archivists, that's with um, kind of tentatively, but I will anyway. So like most of us, I'm deeply fascinated by the material with which I work. The fascination is the expression of a particular flavor of cinephilia, because the power of the moving image is matched only by its inconvenience. The contradiction between our desire to preserve images and sounds forever and their increasing impermanence never gets any easier. 
And the only way to understand this desire is to think of it as manifested really in acts of faith. It's hard to actually touch these ideas. Um, but what I'm going to try to do in today's talk is to address some of the conditions that make us archivists anxious to ask us to put aside some of our received ideas about the practice and the theory of collecting images and sounds, and also try to pose a few harder questions. There are many externalities that affect archives right now, and I don't have much new to say about them. We're faced with a possible end of film. In this age when retro tech has quite a cachet, I'm hard pressed to believe that the end of film is permanent but it's troublesome. We've seen vinyl revive, we've seen Polaroid revive, not so sure film is over. Um, and we're faced with a condition that's systemic, but I really hope can end, the marginalization of the theatrical cinema experience. And we're faced with extremely aggressive and disruptive behavior from a cohort of mostly young but extremely powerful businesses that seek to digitalize the world's economies, cultures, and relationships. But, you know, this is not the entire story. Archives are much more resilient than many might think. If we question some of our examined beliefs, I'm sorry, if we question some of our unexamined beliefs and assumptions, and we experiment with new workflows, new forms of access, and new economic models, we've got a shot at living through the complicated years. And most important, I think we can work and live with less anxiety. The digital turn is no different than other disruptive waves of industrialization, and I must say austerity. Its promoters, the promoters of the digital turn, naturalize its power to overturn by invoking the old idea of creative destruction and proclaiming that there are no other possible alternatives. Its sense of inexorability has roots in countercultures, as the scholar Fred Turner found in his great book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, um, as well as in finance and engineering, and it's promoted day and night. But despite its apparent victory, digitality is fragile. It requires a compliant social order, the accommodation of governments, and the steady availability of energy. It isn't a monolith. The Chinese digital world works very differently than the North American. And its corporate structures and business models are, and this is really important, experimental. We can't overreact today to a force that will behave differently tomorrow. So I think of the relationship between archives and the threats that surround us as asymmetric, but not in the same way that it once was. Even if we're smaller, even if we were once smaller and weaker than large corporations, you know, at first archives were smaller than, and weaker than studios, and we're scared of the studios. You know, the scared studios would yank back material that they claimed ownership to. Now, internet companies, our archives were centralized, complacent, defensive. We circled the wagons to protect our collections and our very existence. But now the big dot-coms are becoming lumbering bureaucracies, and we've got an opportunity to outthink them and be more nimble. There are engineers who would prefer to work at Internet Archive than at Google. Some of us feel we've come late to the battle. This isn't bad. In so doing, we've avoided making premature decisions and made time to observe what we might think of as the enemy. Incrementalism, which at first might have appeared to be the strategy of losers, is in fact radically traditional. Many of the world's great libraries acted out of fear and perhaps out of a sense of inferiority when they signed secret agreements with Google to take pictures of their books. This has not changed the world in the way we thought it would, even though the libraries gave Google the books. For the moment, we're in a phase when books see less use than a generation ago. But this condition existed before Google began to scan. There was nothing of the library in Google's search and advertising model. There's still very little of film archives that surfaces in the embryonic online models we've built or we've seen, so that we can still think freely about the terms with which we would engage those who might want to take our collections online. And it's now clear that digitization is not a one-time project. Just as film-to-film -film copying has been done over and over again as our technology and our skills improve, the first scan isn't an all-or-nothing proposition. Bits are not the enemy. Bits just signify a different operational model of the world. Yes, a new culture, 
is built out of bits. And amnesia about what came before often prevails. But digital culture is just as fragile as digitality. You know, it's a new system of labor that only thinks it's free, and it's exhausting its consumers. Maintaining my new Android cell phone, my social media, my email, my computer, and fixing broken systems is at least a half-time unpaid job. I get impatient when a European contact won't reply to my emails on the weekend, but I envy the higher value that Europeans place on their own time or after 5 p.m. Um, in my work with our library and archives, I've come to realize that digital and physical are not opposites, but complementaries. Each has a different job to do, and you know, I get this from the poet uh, Jen Bervin, who said something like, poems are funny little objects, but they have jobs to do. And it made me realize that actually digital and physical each do different jobs, each is waiting to work with the other. The turn to digital actually revalidates the analog. Um, but it isn't quite the same as it was. It becomes an analog that's hybridized with digital. I make digital films, my urban history uh, shows and my road trips film. I make digital films that play before audiences who talk while the film plays. I thought this was a radical move until I realized what I was doing actually recalled the Elizabethan theater with the loud and boisterous groundlings in the front pit. Where's the loud and boisterous groundling? <laughs> Your cell phones are all off. Letting the actors and the rest of the audience know what they thought about the show. But you know, hybridized analog and digital. Books have a new cachet, and book sales are rising again. It's inconceivable to me that an increasingly thoughtful and educated audience will completely reject film exhibition once they've learned the flaws of its replacements. Recorded sound didn't kill performance. Industrial production and distribution models didn't kill the need to gather in physical spaces and experience collective presence. Capitalism has adapted to foreground certain kinds of digital objects, but it can adapt back the other way. So we might say that film and the theatrical experience are now languishing in, in the valley of neglect. There often seems to be a period of indifference, a period of latency, late in their first life and before their rebirth, when physical objects are widely seen as a liability. This is the period when barges, you know, filled with nitrate film, TV kinescopes, recording masters were dumped off the coast, the age of secretive transports of books out of libraries and to God knows where. The age when VHS tapes are thrown in boxes and put on the street for people without homes to comb through and, and resell. Although Yale University uh, earlier this year acquired uh, 2,700 horror and cult features on VHS, and, and that was the biggest booth, uh, boost for legitimizing VHS collecting I've, I've seen. But at a certain point, the artifact you know, like that regains its cachet. The, th the theatrical experience may be in some kind of eclipse, although not in this building, but in general, but it won't die. And if we see archives as long-term propositions, not temporary arrangements, we can take some time to ponder what the rules of engagement might be with digitality, but there's no excuse for not engaging. Um, I should explain this slide. This was the uh, American Federation of, of Musicians um, taking a rather public stand against recorded music. Can the robot sing of love? Um, this We'll see this again and again. Historians describe a practice they call presentism. We're presentists when we apply current modes of thinking to the past and the future. Right now, it's tempting to eternalize the present and imagine a future that's based on disturbing trends that really haven't been with us for very long. It's short-term thinking to regard the apparent end of film and the collapse of the photochemical manufacturing chain as the definitive threat to film culture. It's presentism to regard digitality as the negation of film culture, or for that matter, to think of digitality as the negation of analog culture. I think that deeply held fe uh, feelings of cinephilia drive us, or drive many of us, to read current history in apocalyptic terms. In our own ways, we're all cinephiles. But you know, cinephilia may not be serving us well. Cinephilia is no defense 
against precarity or competition. Cinephilia doesn't convince budget controllers or uninterested citizens of the urgency of our work. We need to be more than cinephiles. We need to articulate reasons for our practice, not simply accept it on an unspoken level. We need to look outward beyond our walls and beyond our parent organizations. We need to advocate. And the we, these are, this is the archival we. I trust that enough of you are um, emerging or uh, working archivists so you understand who the we is. We need to advocate for institutions and for the field itself. We need to understand that even if we work in a private institution or deep within a government department, we're effectively working for everyone and for those of us not yet born. And, you know, we are rooting for you in Canada and the States. We followed very closely what's happened to archives and libraries in Canada, and we want to see you build them up again. To, to properly serve the records we collect and preserve, we need to do more than love them. And you know, films are extremely powerful. They have great charisma and uh, authority, but they have no power. Films, don't, uh, films lack the power to preserve the institutions that save them. Cinephilia quite naturally engenders the desire to love and to protect, and we've become overprotective. There's too much force majeure in the archives world. We are tasked with enforcing rules that are not of our making. Um, we've earned the right to greater autonomy from those who own or claim rights, and we've earned the rights to make our collections available, especially here. <laughs> There's beautiful collections here, which I think you've earned the right to make available. Our work is hobbled by a precautionary mindset. We are still excessively deferential to non-existent claims from unidentified rights holders who may not even exist. Those that do exist may not respect the work that we do to protect their material and protect their rights. Most archivists are socialized from the beginning of their professional training to assume that archival materials are all someone else's intellectual property. This may not always be the case. I can understand how often we must comply with anachronistic, uh, obviously anachronistic laws, but I have a difficult time understanding why we so often stop short of even questioning them. Um, how do we want to think about copyright as laws evolve? I don't want to go deeply into specifics because I've crossed a national boundary here, but there's two generalized issues I do want to mention. One of them is extended collective licensing. Um, this is very popular in European policy circles. It's being seriously discussed in the United States. The other thing is questions that transcend short-term copyright disputes. Do people know what extended collective licensing ECL is? Is that a a familiar term. So extended collective licensing is its essentially like a class action lawsuit. When you have a body of material that's in question, like so-called orphan films, um, uh, you need to sometimes, there's a feeling that maybe we need to evolve a regime to deal with that material so that it can be used. An extended collective licensing means that an organization is tasked with the um, uh, with, with the um, opportunity to go ahead and license material for who, whose copyright owners may not easily be, may not be known or may not be available. So for example, in Scandinavia, if you wish to use a piece of a home movie in a, uh, a production, you pay some money to some organization, and I'm just, I don't remember exactly, but like the Guild of Amateur Cinematographers, they collect the money and you get an indemnification. And, you know, uh, who knows where the money goes? Um, and who knows how much it costs to collect the tolls? It's, in essence, a disincentive. This is a problem. Um, we could never have built Internet Archive under a regularized orphan works regime. We could have never built Internet Archive under extended collective licensing. Um, and we just need to look and see who's behind these, these questions. The long view, um, this is certainly applicable, I think, uh, across our borders. You know, as cultural custodians, we are obliged to take the long view. And what that means is that we can't postpone thinking about issues that last a lot longer than copyright and pose questions that are much more profound. So for instance, how could we um, temper openness, archival openness, with kindness and respect? 
There's questions of First Nations rights, indigenous or community-based cultural and intellectual property rights, the moral rights of creator. These pose issues that go far, far beyond the bounds of copyright. You know, at a, at a certain point when the current copyright war seemed quaint, these issues will still be with us, issues of kindness, issues of respect, and these issues are intimately related to how we shape the kind of world we'd like to live in. Um, it's a little unfair from the U.S. You know, we have a rich public domain in the U.S., even if its growth is temporarily stunted, so I don't want to be critical of copyright regimes elsewhere in the world. Um, but and we're also the motivating force behind these kind of draconian treaty-based initiatives like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, but whenever you get these anachronistic copyright regimes, you really need to look and question the reason for their existence, understand how they came about, what is the process of lawmaking, and work to check regulations that don't um, uh, protect the interest of archives or their users. Um, archival privilege which I define as the right to control the dissemination of cultural material, you know, whether it's, um, whether the privilege is exercised by archival custodians or by copyright owners, that privilege relies on scarcity. But archives can't control the spread of their holdings anymore. Archival privilege is also quite closely related to generational divides a bad thing. The kind of archival work that's being made by younger makers, um, a lot of remix type material especially, it's sometimes difficult for archives to understand and support. Um, some you know, archivists have even uh, had the courage to come out with a point of view that I disagree with, but that not everybody is qualified to use material, that there should be a certain test of seriousness or a test of, of true contextualization. Um, this is a problem on the supply side, and it rhymes with a problem on the demand side, that the uh, difficulty of getting material out of a lot of archives has led many youngers and author, uh, author, younger authors and media makers to regard arch archives as obstacles to use rather than en enablers of use. You know, simply uh, said, people get it off YouTube. I teach found footage at Santa Cruz, and people, uh, my students, are really completely unconcerned about quality because, in fact, they're looking for an image that, an archival image is, uh, I'm sorry, an archival image that references not just what it contains but references the notion of archival imageness and, in that sense, a deteriorated or a low-res image or a multiply transcoded image often works just as well or better than a pristine image. And, you know, I'm not, I don't want to make the argument that we should always work with pristine images. On the other hand, the detail is so striking, and I'm an evidence person, so I, I love detail. We sometimes worry about loss of control when moving images propagate too freely, especially in digital form. I don't know what too freely might mean. But by contrast, it's the enclosed archives, it's collections that are deprived of their potential to thrill, to educate, and change minds. That's what makes me anxious. Isolation and defensiveness lead some of us to see our work not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. I think poets and musicians and experimental artists, they might have more justification to think this way than we do. If the archives is to be a point of origin and the birthplace of new works rather than the place that films go to die, we've got to rebuild the life cycle of archival material around reuse. And as many of our colleagues in textually based repositories are learning, put the users at the center. Um, it's a complicated issue, but we know that um, the demand for most of our collections, most archival collections, is minuscule and uneven. Uh, a high percentage of, of material never leaves a box. But we can try to increase demand for reuse, I think, through aggressive efforts to expand access. There was a tendency in the, um, uh, especially in the European moving image archives world, to think of the term access as a neoliberal term that principally implied consumption, you know, a sense kind of Rampaging, th rampaging through the archives, but I would prefer to think of access as the process, or perhaps even a better, a continuum that enables the human right to participate in the making of culture 
and the making of history. If I oppose neoliberal attacks on public institutions, and if I oppose the attempt to put a price on everything, the last thing I would wish to do would be to increase archival scarcity. I'm extremely fascinated by the discussions that have occurred in the last few years on film curatorship and the film museum. Some of you may have seen that. Um, excellent uh, uh, discussion on, on film curatorship that came out of Vienna. These, you know, correspond to the vital discussions that are on convergence that are happening in the museum and the library and the archives world. But I want to figure out how we can build museums with permeable walls because bits flow through walls much better than paintings do. Um, these are a few of these attributes of accessible archives. And I, I don't want to go through this point by point, but I think a few of these are kind of interesting. Limits access to collections only as required by law, respect, custom, and unavoidable constraint. Makes materials available before they're requested. Measures value by consumptive use. I've come around to believing that my destiny is to be consumed. You know, consumed doesn't mean eaten alive. Um, sees archival activity as a civic function. Uh, you know, in the same way that, um, uh, how can I say this? Well, put it together with the next piece to build transactional spaces. I'd love to think of the archives as a social space in the same way that a public square is a social place or a meeting hall is a, is a, is a social place. It's possible to perform all sorts of activities relating uh, to making, remaking, and understanding history within the archives. Um, one of the things I've learned since I became a professor at a public university, where 40% of our students are first people in their families to uh, attend college, um, is that uh, you know every generation should have the right to uh, to rethink and to rework the heritage of the of the nation where they're now living. And um, archives could play a, a, you know, I think a, a really key role um, in making that happen. My hero, Robert Binkley, said in 1939 that um, the complete historical consciousness of the people as a whole is the, uh, is the goal of archival policy. Have any of you read Binkley at all? I just have to say, okay, commercial for Robert Binkley. He was this man, he was a modern European historian who smoked too many cigarettes and died quite young. But in a short life, he um, essentially, without knowing anything about technology, he wrote a book that uh, lays the preconditions for the internet. And I know this is said all the time, but he looked at the crisis in scholarly publishing and the crisis in collecting historical materials. And he came up with a sort of radically democratic idea of broadening how history was collected, published, and disseminated, and kind of rethought academia at the same time. A super interesting guy. Um, his uh, his uh, grandson teaches at uh, Alberta, and it's put a lot of his stuff online. It's certainly clear that we can't offer free access to all cultural resources, and yet as we explain the rationales for enclosure, and we excuse ourselves as to why certain materials aren't publicly available. It's our responsibility to specify as clearly as we can why we can't release a record, how and when it will be released, and by whom. If we can't offer openness right now, let's at least plan for it. And I also think a plan for openness should specify which records we're going to declare to be outside the realm of property. By that, I mean which records will we decide are open to everybody. There was a discussion for a while in Europe about making uh, moving image records of the Holocaust, placing them outside the realm of licensing. Um, we've put the, uh, we, we believe that the film uh, shot from the cable car in Market Street, 1906, just before the earthquake is public property, and we've put up the full HD, you know, just kind of as a stunt to try to break the Internet Archives bandwidth. It's like 160 gigs or something like that. But that's a film that belongs to the world. You know, we're not going to collect money off that film. We have a lot of practical problems that we cannot easily dismiss, but, you know, we can change the way we think about them. David Francis called for an experimental archive a few years ago. I've really been interested in doing that, a place you could try out ideas where you could put into practice ideas that you've only really discussed theoretically 
quickly, where you can change, where you can back off and, and try something different. You know, librarians do this. Digital humanities people do this. If the archives are going to start to um, converge a little bit with a museum, we might also remember to build a lab. This doesn't have to uh, take a lot of money. These could be modest experiments as well. Um, we bemoan the digital fire hose, the flood of undifferentiated production that we can't appraise, describe, contextualize, or collect, let alone preserve. Um, but I'm actually myself more interested in the backlogs of physical film, because physical backlogs are getting really hard to deal with. They seem to defy processing efforts. And therefore, I wonder, could we bring non-professionals into the back rooms to physically work with materials, to annotate, to repair, conserve, to prep for copying and scanning? Could we build what I'm calling the participatory physical archives? I ran a two-year experiment in San Francisco that was supervised by archivists trained at the uh, Selznick School, including Antonella Bonfanti from here in Toronto. And we did minimal and, uh, processing and scanning prep on 4,800 out of 12,000 home movies in our collection. It wasn't a complete and total success. It was really hard to train people to splice 35 in frame. Um, all the synchronizers in the world can't help you splice 35 millimeter film and keep it in frame. Um, but we exchanged paraprofessional archival training for film work that otherwise wouldn't happen, and a lot of people got jobs out of it. We let the public in the back of the archive, so to speak, not just in the gallery or research rooms. Could we bring the best makers into the archives to work with us and make new films? Imagine the archives as a place of production place where films are made, games coded, websites designed, books written, TV transmitted. Um, why can't archivists do some of this themselves? There's this long time idea which is sometimes elevated to an ethic that archivists and archives shouldn't themselves do research or production. But I think we could let this long time uh, ant antinomy rest. We've got to get over that. Why can't archivists be makers as well? We have the education and the skills. Could we operate creative labs that um, are about remaking archival workflows themselves? You know, we see hackathons. We now see them at AMIA, places where new software tools get made. Um, there's a long, long do-it-yourself tradition in archival culture. You know, the early printers to um, at the National Film Archive in the UK to shorter pitch sprockets that are machined to handle shrunken film to the many uh, DIY film scanner projects we see on YouTube to David Rice's apps to analyze um, digital video streams. David Rice studied film at Salznick, and he started to wonder, uh, where are the per what are the perforations in video? How do you maintain sync in video? What are the sprocket holes in video? And started to look at the headers in digital video. Every frame has um, a huge amount of information in the header. And he started to look at that forensically and realized that you could make all kinds of discoveries. For example, um, uh, well, very quickly he got a call from the U.S. Department of Defense saying, are you able to help us figure out, you know, which cameras shot the same video? And he said, well, you know, I actually work for democracy now. I don't think I'm going to work for the U.S. Department of Defense. <laughs> we lament that so little of our material is of interest to researchers and producers. Well, you know, if that's true, if our material is so poorly used, why don't we consider paying people to use our collections? Um, we kind of already do this. We do commissions, we do contests, we do residencies, we subsidize. I'm not being facetious when I suggest that if our mission is to push historical and cultural materials out into a crowded and often indifferent present, then it actually might be appropriate to find more adventurous ways of encouraging people to use our material because quiet archives are much more anxiety-provoking than noisy ones. Um, I suspect that one way to become clear about where we're heading is to reinvest the archives with a sense of intentionality. Each moving image record was created for a reason. 
and the intentionality of particular records coalesce into what we know as the archives. But this tradition of archival neutrality keeps us from fixing on intentions, on missions, and on outcomes, because we need to do a lot more than simply preserve the cultural heritage for the future. This work isn't as neutral as we sometimes say it is, and archivists themselves should be encouraged to play much more of an interpretive role. We could address these misunderstandings about archival work. We could push forward a bundle of new narratives that say, um, look, that speak to the centrality of archives in the world. Um, why should we do this? Because to engage in, the, in archival activity is to intervene in the flow of history. Even the most passive collection that simply responds to other people's queries plays an interventionist role. Some possible futures. So. Um, I'm really interested in environmental thinking and eco-criticism as a framework for archival thinking. And lately, I'm looking at the permaculture principles diagram. And you know, at least at some of the points around the clock, it makes a pretty good archival manifesto. And there's been some criticism of, of, of permaculture. You know, it was some guys from uh, New Zealand. And some people say, look, this is traditional knowledge that, in essence, they've appropriated, and I think that's very true, but um, it's also a really interesting systematization of some good ideas, but when you think of um, catch and store energy, harvest while it's abundant, you know, collect the flood, use and value renewables, reduce dependency on scarce resources, this is all about the uh, recycling of images and sounds, design from pattern to detail, you know, this is uh, in a lot of ways, this is, uh, you know, respect for the fawns, um, small, slow solutions, uh, many of the regional archives and collecting projects uh, that um, have started small and slow, actually, I think, are the ideological and the workflow leaders. You know, leadership in our field isn't coming from big centralized institutions anymore. Use and value diversity. Diversity leads to resilience. Um, don't just collect one thing. Don't collect the records of one community. Um, try to, to challenge the paradigm from which you feel you come. But most important, I mean, this is this great thing, and it's not solely a permaculture idea, but use edges, value the marginal. The origin of this idea is that evolution happens where different ecological communities meet. You know, that at the seashore where aquatic organisms meet land-based organisms, um, that there's a rapid uh, exchange of genetic information, rapid flow, rapid evolution, and it's precisely at those edges. You know, it's when, um, when in New York established archives at universities met the Occupy movement, all sorts of questions about privacy, about collecting highly ephemeral records, about collecting records um, generated by people who didn't want their identities known and who were too focused on trying to build a future and weren't at all interested in documenting a past. That was a huge bump for uh, conversations about archival theory and practice. But anyway, I like this. Um, I like this this manifesto, and uh, you know our. Conversations about archives suffer from an excess of practicality. Some of us engage in reflection, and there's been a couple of really good articles in, in our journals recently, but quite often these initiatives are, um, are, are the thoughts of just a few people. They don't percolate through the field. Theorists who don't do archival work project all sorts of ideas onto what they call the archive. For them, archives can be blank screens, even playthings. And you know, scholars and, and, uh, and media producers regard archives as repositories for what they wish we collected, made available in the ways they want to use it. We spend a lot of time resisting the identities that are projected onto us. But only a few scholars actually um, walk the walk and work directly with archivists. I can't think of many scholars who've spent even a day rewinding film or shifting cans from one vault to another or digitizing videotape. And in fact, workflow is almost completely absent in academic discussions of the archive. And yet workflow is far more political, far more potent in its effects on archives than 100 conferences.
Um, you know, I'm tempted to think of all kinds of things, like the uh, devaluation of domestic work compared to the uh, valuation of, let's say, industrial labor. But interesting point. Uh, despite the gap between the archive and archives, between theory that takes little account of what archives really are and what they do, we need to harvest ideas that we can use. There's a rapidly growing corpus of thought about the archive that, although it rarely takes account of actual archival work, it's valuable. It's, in fact, sometimes even urgent for us to engage with. So I hesitate before mentioning this. Um, but I find an empty center in many of the discussions about moving images and moving image archives. Since the very beginning of the modern film archives movement, I'm speaking about the 30s, the beginning of the FIAF collections, I think there's been a steady retreat from explaining why we engage in collecting and preserving film, why archives exist and why they're important, and what our goals might be. It's certainly possible that one of the archivist's less celebrated skills is the ability to hide, to maintain a safe environment for collections by staying under the radar. And of course, we've had to hide, historically, from rights owners who would repossess materials, and bureaucrats who might not understand the importance of what we do, or functionaries who might want to destroy embarrassing collections. You know, all this is understandable, but archives can't continue to rely on oversimplified, inoffensive, celebratory statements geared for public consumption. The quiet that we often maintain facing out is matched by quiet looking in. For the most part, moving image archives exist in a kind of teleological vacuum. It's good that we exist, but I've yet to see much thoughtful examination as to why. And if you look back, you know, you'll find some really interesting use cases. And you'll find a lot of celebratory statements. And every so often at the, Arca at the Oscars, you know, they'll talk about the shimmering, ghostly images of the past that remind us of something. I don't know. I, but, but our work is too complex and too difficult to hide behind vague terms and behind the missions that are formally assigned to archives, you know, depot legal, heritage preservation, maintenance of the judicial, administrative, evidential record. But the near religious reasons, and I'm speaking about cinephilia, you know, that can't be shared with lay people, don't rise to the level of justifying the very special work that we have to do with fragile materials. And they don't give us the ammunition we need to defend ourselves against those who don't consider our work important enough to fund. To actively consider the reasons for our existence is also to ask, could we, as archivists, point ourselves towards an agenda that we wish to make real? David Nye, an eminent historian of technology, says at this point he advocates kind of an eclectic approach to theory. Um, he made this remark. He made these remarks at the uh, Society for the History of Technology conference in uh, Dearborn, Michigan last November. Um, and I think his, his arguments cross, his remarks cross over well. They raised kind of a ruckus among the tech historians who didn't want to hear this. He said, no grand theory is adequate to our interdisciplinary enterprise. If we use concepts carefully with an awareness of their provenance, they can give a theoretical dimension to the history of tech without confining it to a single system of thought. Many historians practice this principled eclecticism. This bricolage is not just defensible. It's more durable and provides more robust arguments than reliance on any single theory because our work is interdisciplinary and multi-vocal. I think that's a nice carryover. Um, when I was young, the best holiday present a kid could get was an electric train set. But today, electric trains have largely become specialized playthings for adults, like Neil Young. Simple wooden train sets are back in vogue. I take this to mean that we cannot necessarily assume that the current fascination with technological tools and with digitality will last forever. And that as Raymond Williams suggests, we're living in a culture where the emergent and the residual coexist and interact. So as we plunge into the digital vortex, I would hope that we'd remember the core tenet of conservatorship, reversibility of process. Let us not deny change, but let us also remember that much of the future will lie in the unresolved past. And with that, I say thanks.
everybody <laughs> can see you a little better from here. So we'd like to open it up uh, to the audience. Does anybody have a question for Rick? Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about experimental archives? And um, I don't know, there's been some really interesting um, texts I've read in the last few years, like uh, Hern Froke and um, Frederick Kittler and Wolfgang Ernst were creating this archive of visual concepts for, and these often had to do with found footage making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just curious what you've seen in the past few years that's been effective. I've heard a lot, I've read a lot, but I've seen very little actually develop out of it. Well, you know the example um, that you mentioned. These are um, these are uh, uh, German-speaking men who um, are interested in media archaeology, and sort of one of the tenets of that is that me media is material. That we're not going to focus, at least for some time, on messaging so much as on the technology that makes the exchange of data and information and transition possible. And I guess what is sort of the experimental archival piece there, is that you give up a sense of continuity. It's a staccato discipline. It's an orchestral score that doesn't really have logical development. Media archaeologists are as interested in false starts as and in mistakes as they are in, in masterworks and continuity. Um, and I think that's actually one tenet of experimentalism, that rather than... Um, how can I say this? Uh, many moving image archives have been uh, overly, the, 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 the shape of their practice has been overly determined by the sort of shape of cinema and media study. So for example, you know, the auteur focus in, um, in, in film history led to building collections, you know, that were based on authors and on studios. Um, and there was a lot less work with material that challenged, um, you know, I'm thinking of home movies and industrial films, but I'm also thinking of outsider cinema, of material that um, actually may not even be cinematic. You know, it might be home recordings. It might be material that was meant to be presented in, in situations that we don't, that don't really exist anymore. Um, so the, so on a, I'm, I'm sorry, I could explain this a little more theor more clearly. On the level of what you collect, that's one thing. I'm interested in tweaking workflow. So for example, right now, um, most people who work with actual physical materials wear white coats, they're trained. Um, there's this sense that they're working with unique objects, mistakes can't be made. And this is no longer sustainable. I mean, I just don't think there's ever gonna be the funding to give the full inspection, conservation, repair, and scanning treatment, you know, to every every physical element that, that exists in archives. And so I think we need to experiment with ways of doing that. Um, we could decentralize, these could be public practices. Uh, you could work with paraprofessionals with citizens. Um, I'm trying to set up a research project where um, uh, a collective of people actually manages a, a complex collection and where everybody who works there uh, not only um, determines their, the, you know, what they understand as the priorities for working with specific material, but that at the same time they work with it, that they're encouraged to disseminate it at the same time, so that the role of the, the archivist and pro the roles of the archivist, producer, and artist um, fuse together. That I think is tremendously interesting, treating it as a workshop where, um, uh, where arts and crafts are, are, are allied rather than, than split. So um, I got off to a bit of a slow start there, but I hope that's a, a, a useful response. Any more questions? Uh, hi. Thank you for this fascinating talk. Uh, I have a specific question about, uh, the talk was great, I have a specific question about the idea you put forward towards the end, uh, in particular where you show that a tweet of yours in which you stated that the archive as a concept has been over theorized, <laughs> but uh, archives as places of work and labor have been under theorized. And uh, I really agree with that idea and I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit um, how such a theory of archival work m may look like and perhaps also share if you have begun doing some 
writing and research in this direction. You know, um, we could blame Foucault or we could blame Derrida, but you know, I don't want to be mean to to francophone theorists. It's that's purely coincidental. But there's been a, an, an immense attraction to 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 what is called the archive among people who do theory in almost every realm. And 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 this is interesting. You know, much of it could, in, much of it is actionable. But in another way, um, the archive it's become terra nullius. This has been another thing I've said about it. You know, it's a term that's open for occupation by anybody. Um, and it doesn't really leave us with very much at the same time that we have this very kind of rich and diverse and often, in fact, quite flaky theorization of what the archive is. And, you know, I, I, I wince now and I'm at a conference because everybody's going the archive this, the archive that. And um, it's... Uh, and, you know, part of it is that there's no respect for archival labor. Part of it is that there's an expectation that somebody's actually doing the physical work. But part of it is also that we end up... Um, with a term that's as vague as writing, a term that's as vague as, I don't know, um, organic, uh, you know. And I'd love to restore some specificity to it. Um, I've, I'm, I am writing about this. I'm going to present a paper in January in, at the Modern Language Association of all places. There's a panel on precisely this topic, and I couldn't resist trying to intervene, you know, and rant about it. Um, but I'd love to see, I mean, you know, there's this constant um, head, brain, hands, uh, you know, division uh, in scholarship. And this is an opportunity to really bring it back together because I do believe, you know, that um, archival work is many things. It's performance, it's celebration, it's also art and it's craft. And it would be nice to, just as I think the archives are a great place to stage social encounters, it would be a great place to, um, you know, kind of stage a certain um, uh, reuniting of these uh, elements, um, which are kind of class-based that are often seen separately. Yes, over here. Thank you so much for your talk. It was extremely interesting. and. I really like your ideas of access, but I was wondering, like, I would think that access, if we changed how we approach access and how we approach the archive, it would reverberate throughout the whole way that we structure archives. And so I was wondering how you would think this would affect things like archival arrangement, archival description, whether you see that as a site as well for experimentation. Um, so that's a really, really good question, and I love that it actually gets to workflow and uh, you know and and, sp and and the specific orientations with which we look at material. One of the things that's great now, you know, it, in software is that we can simulate different arrangements. Um, we can respect fonts without necessarily having to them being the only mode of of organization. Um, so in some ways, this is often done, you know, when archive catalogs go online by hyperlinking everything. Um, that's that, that's one very simple thing. Um, what what we're what we're going to see happening in the next few years, um, and initially we're going to see this in you know the large, rich, well-funded digital repositories is that machines are going to do a lot of the classifying, and you know and initially they're going to do very simple buckets, you know like. Uh, Footage of animals versus footage of human beings. Footage that's historical versus footage of being new. Footage that has text in it that can be, uh, you know, that computers can read versus uh, footage that's more diffuse. Um, and that's going to force humans into um, a more thoughtful assessment of what cataloging description and arrangement might mean. I used to, um, when I jumped into selling stock footage of public domain materials as a way of funding, you know, our increasingly outrageously expensive, <laughs> my outrageously expensive collecting habits, um, I, I started to do shot lists, you know, where you have a time reference and then you say close up of hand pulling, you know, big high voltage electrical switch. And you can't do that anymore, you know, for our home movies, I've moved to tagging. 
And one of the wonderful things about tags is that although they begin as uncontrolled vocabulary, they have um, a funny way of starting to control themselves over time. They um, begin to converge on a smaller vocabulary, and so they, they're kind of self-controlling. I don't know if there's research on this, but it's, it's my empirical finding. Um, what happens if you have a community-based uh, cataloging effort where um, they don't just try to say, uh, you know, this is the, uh, the Jane Smith family collection of home movies, but they try to contextualize it in a very different way. Um, we can keep the Jane Smith collection together if we know, you know, if we already have some kind of a record, um, and we can flag, uh, we, 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 we can flag the fonts, but we don't necessarily have to observe it. Am, am I, is this at all responsive? Like, I question this causality that you bring up of the tagging and of the, our of the digital kind of forcing us into a new mode of arrangement and of practice. Like, I, I, I know, I just, I just question whether that is how it's going to play out, or whether we have more of an agency in determining how the digital behaves rather than the other way around. Um, so I accept, I, I, I accept what you're saying there. I think um, uh, I'm, in a, I'm giving too much agency to YouTube. Um, YouTube has really changed a lot of people's understanding of what a media archive might be and not, not necessarily for the better, although there's many virtues about YouTube. But I'm going to say that I think you kind of nailed it. You know, yes, we should uh, figure out what we want to do with these tools and we shouldn't accept somebody else's notion of, 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 of how they um, ought to behave and how we should categorize things. On the other hand, though, I'm, you know, um, our home movie collection is pushing 14,000 items. And um, we're always going to, with that, we're always going to have to do, you know, an MPLP, a more product, less process approach to the extent that you can do that with moving images that are infinitely complex. We're never going to be able to do um, deep research and write detailed finding aids on those collections or describe materials in depth. So we're going to end up doing something that's a little bit sloppy. I guess that was also on my mind. But um, you're right. Um, so I had a question, actually, to talk, and I can hand it to you after, Brian. I um, really appreciated that you were talking about the backlog because a lot of the people in the audience online and in the audience here are also people who have um, small libraries, regional archives, not that many um, staff hours. Could you talk a little bit more about your example of the, of the para-archivist or some ways that we could have participants because we are we are fortunate in this city that we have a lot of cultural workers, a lot of people that love arts and culture and want to support and advocate for it. What are some of those kind of small concrete steps people could take towards that, getting rid of some of that backlog? You, you mentioned some of it for online, but some of the physical, some of the concrete um, physical materials. So um, remember I talked about that guy Robert Binkley during yeah. the Depression. He apparently is the man who um, came up with the idea through the, the Works Progress Administration and our New Deal of employing uh, unemployed um, white collar workers to do newspaper indexes and to inventory local history archives. Um, we, I do these local history events, as you know, and one of the issues we run into is this question. Some people have defined it as the kind of the um, unresolved contradictions between history and heritage. Um, a lot of people are very interested in local history. There's a lot of subject specialists. It's easy to find people who will correct your description of railroad footage, um, for example, or theater organs, you know, or... Uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, candy stores. Um, there's a way that, um, there's a way in my field, in old industrial and educational films, where um, uh, a lot of the things that people post to, let's say, IMDB, or a lot of the corrections they post to Internet Archive are faith-based rather than research-based. 
Um, you know, there's this myth that the internet propagates that Ed Wood directed the film Dating Do's and Don'ts as a, it's kind of a false syllogism. Dating Do's and Don'ts is a bad film, and it was made in 1949. Ed Wood was making bad films in 1949, so therefore Ed Wood. Um, in a practical sense, I think what we should try to do is figure out um, some strategies for uh, um, turning history into infrastructure. I believe that history is like air and water, and it should be all around us. You know, And there's emerging technologies that allow us to kind of historicize the environment. But there are many people who are great human resources to do that. But we need to come up with some consensus about what history is and how we're going to treat it. I think the way to do it is to think of um, uh, so one of the, after like 10 years of doing this Lost Landscapes of San Francisco, I've come to realize that the annual screenings, which are big, wonderful, exuberant events, it's, it's not the end. That's a means to an end. The, the end that we're desiring is a much more historically conscious population. And the way to do that is bottom up and grassroots and try to figure out a way to make it worthwhile um, for people to gather together and interpret records with local or with um, you know special significance. And then all of that material can be held um, in a decentralized way, but you know, metadata and sometimes records themselves could be, you know, held in bigger repositories. But I mean, you know, I'm I'm kind of advocating uh, it's like mass scrapbooking or quilting bees. You know, um, I'm 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 definitely advocating uh, that that people work on this material. Uh, otherwise, it's beyond. You know, we're going to leave it to machines. Hi, thanks for a really inspiring talk. I wanted to maybe briefly go back to this question from before about the archive as over-theorized and archives and ask if you might agree with me that this is in some ways a disciplinary problem that those of us who teach, especially now that you teach at Santa Cruz, those of us who teach in film and media studies can sort of uh, you know, help to do something about with our students because it seems to me that uh, part of the problem in film and media studies is that we're sort of slow to the game and that even despite the historical turn, it's still really easy for, say, somebody to become a professor in film and media studies at a major university having no experience whatsoever with archives or with the kind of study of film and media as historical objects. And in contrast, a field like history, I think is really, people in history are really deeply engaged in theorizing the work of archives and the labor of the archivists. So rather than thinking about our francophone point of reference as Derrida, we could think about somebody like Alain Farge, whose great book, The Allure of the Archive, is precisely about right the deep work of archiving and the experience of the archive. So I think in history, they're really good at it. But what's really interesting here, I think, and you could really speak to this, is that historians aren't always as good at dealing with images and especially moving image objects. So even despite Hayden White's call many years ago for a greater engagement with historiophity and the image, historians aren't so good. So there's a kind of black hole there between film and media scholars' ability to deal with images, but, but often inability to engage with the archive, and historians' great ability to kind of think about archival work, but inability sometimes to engage with images. And I wonder if we as, uh, as teachers you know, can help to instill that in our students and help to overcome some of the problems you talked about today. Thanks. Um, it's a real interesting point. I mean, for, you know, for one thing, it's really, really hard to, um, to understand the way that film and, and media moving images work with a clear head, because they're just sensually overwhelming. Um, and the experience is so complicated, and I don't think it's well understood. The Arlette Farge book is wonderful. It's very sensuous. You know, it's about smell and fragility, and it's a phenomenal. It, it, it's just a very deeply, um, she is writing about the evidence of her senses. Um, <laughs> the way I want to say this is kind of a little bit roundabout, so I'm going to do it really quickly. If you're a musician and you want to demonstrate something to somebody, you can play a few notes on the keyboard. If you're a um, an artist, you can do a quick sketch, you know, and show something. 
um, if you're a poet and you come up with a line, you can jot a few lines down on a, on a post-it or on a blackboard. If you make moving images or if you talk about moving images or if you're trying, you have to use an incredibly complex system uh, to make something in a moving image. You can't spontaneously make a moving image very, unless you make a vine, you know, or you shoot something with your, your phone. But authorship is so mediated. And in the same way spectatorship is so mediated, Ar uh, uh, the scholars for years, their work has been limited on what they have access to. This is why people only started writing about industrial films relatively a few years ago. And I don't know that we're ever quite going to fix that. Um, you know, it really is a, a, a discipline that writes about reflections and perceptions. Um, I just hope that more people actually get in the archives. I went to a conference at MIT. They do this Media and Transition Conference a few years ago, and everybody was like, cast these scholars were all castigating librarians and arguing, you mean you don't collect this? You mean you don't have TV commercials from Africa? You mean that this series wasn't saved? How can you say this? And it was relatively privileged academics getting pissed off at librarians and archivists who weren't given the money or the agency, you know, and it primarily primarily um, uh, female workforce, um, so there were real elements, I thought, of sexism in that discourse as well. You know, archivists were being, scholars had outsourced um, the collection of research material to this class of people, and then they were trashing them for not collecting enough. So I, I, I mean, I, I think media archaeology should be key in media studies. Um, I pass around now in all my film classes, I pass around film and videotape, I bring in nitrate. I tell them that, don't tell anybody about this, you have to close the doors. And I really don't want you telling it, you know, I really play up the mystique. I say, I could lose my job <laughs> if, you t if you tell anybody about this, but this is nitrate film. And, and they love it, you know, but, but they can smell it. And they have a, because uh, people have never seen anything with perforations. Materiality. Over here. Hi, I'm uh, here as a uh, collage filmmaker um, yeah. who came to the uh, came to archival, I guess amateur archival work through that, um, and I'm excited by your uh, talking about the idea of merging archival and creative practice, and I guess I'm coming at that from the other side, and in a lot of cases, the archive that I have built uh, built up. Like I, I've, uh, because of the uh, stigma and regime around around uh, copyright and appropriation, I've basically been working from a position mentally of just being an outlaw for a couple of decades, and that's uh, now that my mom is going on a fixed income and the collection is spilling out into the barn. I have to figure <laughs> figure something out here. So I'm, I, I guess I'm, I, I, I want to know: Are there, are like from the perspective of an artist trying to preserve archival materials that by and large came to me because they've been orphaned by the institutions that were charged with their care like are there are there models for <coughs> for the the intersection of archival and, and creative practice are there are there networks are there resources hmm you know, I think a lot of the people who work with Center for Home Movies, a lot of the regional home movie archivists have thought this through. Um, there are a few, and I can't speak so much about Canada, but in the States there's a few institutional archives where there's um, people working who I would consider artists. We were talking about Indiana, where you were earlier. You know, that's a, a kind of a unique arrangement of people. Um, I think that many people there work in creative practice. I think some of the people at the Academy in LA, you know, Mark Toscano, who preserves um, uh, experimental and avant-garde film is, is a maker himself. Um, but it's a little bit about, you know, uh, there still is a, and you know, when it came out of this old issue about archivists shouldn't compete with researchers, right? Archivists shouldn't have privileged access to material in a repository, and that uh, can be an important principle because so when it's violated, it, it's awful. But, um, you know, I, I'd love to encourage artist archivists. The only way we could probably do that is subsidize that work or reward it a little bit more. 
Um, but in the same way that you know professors are supposed to do research, teaching, and service, archivists maybe should be encouraged to do research and, and production as well, and service to the field. I mean, you know, archivists are scholars as well as. I, I don't have an easy model for you. There's lots of individuals, um, but I think it's a role that's going to emerge, especially as we become a, um, you know, a series of, of, of cultures that are much more focused on the past. I think we need to consolidate our efforts among filmmakers and between film filmmakers and archivists, figure out where the interfaces are that work. You know, the, the, the Internet Archive fosters a lot of work just because it makes a lot of raw material accessible. But what we really need is a place where you can actually pull material, whether it's film or tape or digital, you know, off a reel or a, a simulated shelf and work with it in the same way that you could go to the library and you could scan a picture out of a book. It needs to be that simple. Um, thank you for a thought-provoking talk. Um, I want to come back to this issue of, um, you know, sort of digital or crowdsourcing. And, and it seems to me that in archives, we have not yet had that conversation that is starting many in museums where it's like, what do you need a professional, you know, archivist to do, and what can other people do, and what part of our jobs can we change? And as an archival educator, I obviously believe big time that some the role that archivists play needs a master's degree. But there's a lot of stuff that's not going to cut it in the long term if we don't try to find things that we do do that can be done by um, people that want to volunteer their time. The other thing I've always thought is that we don't have a really good sense of what volunteers get. Like, what do you get from coming in and donating your time to an archives? And, and if we could figure that out, you know, we've got a new prime minister who really believed in getting young people and get them to work for very little money. And I'm like, oh, Katimovic for archivists, you know, or, or to, we just have to go there soon and, and get him to fund us. But I just wonder about how do we go about finding that value proposition, not from our perspective, but from the person, the volunteer. What, what did they get from this process? And also, how can we make sure that they get a lot, as well as not completely eroding um, the idea that you actually need professional archivists and you need that vision and understanding and theoretical background to many complex problems. Um, so I, I really love that question. Um, to take the first part of it, to, to jump back to the beginning, um, some of the classic, uh, the canonical missions of, of professional archivists like appraisal, you know, deciding what's a permanently valuable record, um, contextualization, description. This is very hard for somebody off the street with good intentions to do. And um, also, I think, planning. Um, you know, one thing I didn't say in my talk, uh, it's um, uh, what is the impact of a project to do preservation? What is the impact of an access project? You really need experience and, and, and training to be able to do that. So we did this participatory archives project with volunteers. Volunteers take a lot of management. Um, I've never found, you know, volunteers are, are it can be really wonderful, but it's, it's work. Um, I had all these ambitions. I wanted to train, you know, this cadre of people to be trained moving image archivists in San Francisco. Uh, I wanted people to be able to get work. I also had arranged, um, uh, there were clients for the kind of work that we were doing, people that were willing to pay the group. The group explored becoming a co-op or becoming a collective, but people didn't really want to do that. And what I found the volunteers really wanted to do is touch film. They wanted to have an experience that's a little bit, you know, I'm not going to say steampunk. That's one way of kind of understanding it, um, you know. But fundamentally, the value proposition for most of the 36 people in our extended group was that they wanted to touch film. Um, and that was it. They wanted to have a physical experience, an experience with physical film. And that's really, really interesting. In a sense, that comes back to your question. Um, 
you know, uh, there's a magic associated with that. Uh, for a lot of people, you know, they would, if I had funding to keep this going, they'd still be working on it. Um, some people were interested in specific uh, histories. Some people wanted skills. But mainly people just wanted to touch film. They especially wanted to touch eight, interestingly enough. Regular eight. I mean, regular eight is a mystical medium, you know, because it's an extension of the hand and the eye. You know, it's like the camera stilo that the that uh, people talked about. You know, it's it, it's writing with your with your hand and eye. In some ways, it's the purest of all that in 35. 16 is like a bastard in a way. You know, it's in between or something. But um, but there's a mystique about touching aid, which everybody calls super aid, even though it's not super aid. Um, so I'm, I'm not really answering, but that's what I found empirically as the value proposition. I think history, um, resistance, you know, in some communities I think would be really important, community-based resistance uh, to change or to outside forces. Um, but, uh, you know, it's always going to be a few people. So, if you, um, I think people want to be part of a community, so it's a place to go and meet like people. And, you know, if, if I'm not a film geek, but if you were a film geek, it seems to me it would be great to sit around and talk to other people that also share that same passion. And, but I think understanding more of all the various aspects that people get from it. And I do think we can teach skills that, you know, as a volunteer. And anyway, it's just an interesting, we need, so, we need to understand so much more than about work processes than we do in the archives. Yeah, I think, I think um, that's very, very true. And, I, and it's hard to quantify things like the satisfaction of the sound of a projector going, but that is a real turn on for a lot of people. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, this is kind of going to speak to the the film collector, the film geek part of you. Um, I'm interested because I uh, curate uh, the home movie day in our local library, and right now I'm um, sitting on lots of old eph ephemeral films, and they want to uh, put a program together to actually get to show this stuff because it's fascinating, right? So I'm kind of wondering how it began for you in the archive. Um, did you somehow, uh, you know, come upon a university throwing out all their films and then thinking, oh, my God, I have to keep this? Or where did it begin? Um, to make a, a, a fairly long story very short, I was working on a documentary film called Heavy Petting, which was being made by my housemate and somebody else. And my housemate had been one of the people that made Atomic Cafe, and it was on sexuality and romance and the post-World War II period. How do you make a film about something that's as diffuse as sexuality and romance? And, uh, you know, I decided to look to the films that trained people and to the sort of subjects of the post-war period. So I started getting very interested in educational and sponsored films, and then I began to collect. And this was a time of media transition, you know, when film was being swapped out for video. Media transitions are always a great time to collect things. Like right now, it's a great time to collect VHS if you've got a big house um, <laughs> and a lot of patience and um, and a lot of time. But uh, so very quickly, you know, I started collecting from schools and university libraries that were being dumped, and then I started going to production companies, and then I started going to labs. And it's really easy. You know, in the US, we throw away more media than most nations ever produce. So um, by the time that the Library of Congress acquisition was finished, they got 200,000 cans of material. And you know, I, I'm not good at that many things, but I seem to be very good at collecting things. It's just whatever. Um, so I've s tried to stop. But, um, but I think. Um, you know, we, we collectors do what archives can't do, um, and typically that material tends to devolve into large repositories that don't have, the, you know, Library of Congress got 18 tractor trailers from us, the largest acquisition I think they've ever received, and most of it still hasn't been unboxed yet, you know, 
It'll be millions of dollars just to get in there and decide what they want to keep. Um, so we solve problems, we create them. This whole question of physical kibble, you know, do physical objects have a right to exist? It's an immensely complicated and unresolved question. And as I kind of said in the talk, we're spending all of our money worrying about bit rot and digital decay and format obsolescence. And meanwhile, the physical backlog just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, we just have to make sure that the decisions to junk stuff are, are relatively transparent. Right now, they're not. Other questions? Um, I'll just follow up on what you said about um, the reasons for junking things are not transparent. What Can you elaborate a bit on that? You know, um, archivists and librarians deal with big problems. And, you know, we run a private research library in San Francisco that's open to the public about nine days every month, and libraries have given us the most amazing things, valuable uh, things that they just can't keep. And there's a physical objects are inconvenient in many cases, and those decisions are often made quietly. Um, uh, you know, I guess if the AGO decides to sell a painting, that's no longer core, that would be a pretty open decision. But when a library decides to get rid of its collection of government documents because it's in a bunch of other libraries, even if it's filled with um, amazingly beautiful old lithographed atlases, that decision is never very public. Um, and we've received so much film from uh, archives that it was inconvenient for them to keep it or it was out of scope. and. Um, there's kind of a food chain. Uh, I think you probably, many of you probably know this. You know, we're, we're sort of the bottom feeders, the carp. I don't <laughs> Do you think it would help kind of the role of advocating for archives if that process of deaccessioning was actually explained and was more transparent. Big time. I'm. I think. Uh, you know. I'm an advocate of, um, and nobody else. I think is so far. But that. Um. You know how we do an environmental impact statement. We're going to build a subway station. We do an EIS about what it means to the. Uh, you know, to the environment. Are there are there graves underneath? What's the historical resources? It's going to pollute the stream. Um. I think we should do environmental impact statements about preservation and access and also deaccessioning initiatives. That would be a really great idea. What if funders required it? Um, you know, people wouldn't have uh, uh, carped so much about the Google book scanning project if it had been possible for them to just step outside the realm of, of business um, for a little bit. Um, and, you know, I don't want to trash Google because it turns out in a lot of ways they have not been the bad guys about this. They've um, They've made an incredible precedent for fair use, and in some ways the libraries are sketchier. The libraries that got scanned are a lot sketchier than Google, so I'm not here to, to, to criticize Google, but there's something about the interaction of business and finance and secrecy that doesn't work very well in the archival world. Yes, over here. Um, since you were talking about environmental impact, um, I'm curious, uh, as an archivist who's um, interested in the environment, of, of course, you, on one hand, you have um, large rooms that have to be refrigerated, and on the other hand, you have huge data farms that have to be also refrigerated. But uh, in terms of this collecting impulse, it seems to also be fairly detrimental to uh, ecological health as well. So I wondered how you, how you think, out, think around that as an archivist. It's a it's a huge problem, and there's um, there's a uh, uh, there's a, a group of archivists that are focused now on issues of climate change, both in terms of the survival of collections, but also what we can do to treat them more sustainably and not waste as much energy. Um, Internet Archive is trying to do whatever they can at room temperature. They actually don't refrigerate. Um, the, the servers, uh, they, they're doing a lot of innovative things. They use heat from the servers to heat their headquarters during the colder months in San Francisco, which you can do because it's not really cold. Um, there's a bunch, there's a guy named Tom McCarty there who's working with steady temperature, and he's done analysis of um, how you can keep physical printed materials like books and so on at a steady but not a tremendously low temperature and humidity. 
and Brewster wants him to do the same thing for film, and I'm skeptical. But it's just going to be one of these things. Do we decide that these objects are culturally valuable enough that they're going to take... Um, they'll be part of our energy budget. I just don't take any of that for granted. I mean, you know, I live in a coastal city. We saw what happened in New York with Hurricane Sandy where um, a bunch of archival collections were damaged by flooding. Um, all of this is going to be increasing. I mean, whole nations are going to disappear. So this question of, um, you know, is it justifiable to, to, to spend a lot of um, our energy budget and resources on, on saving historical collections is going to come up again and again and again and again. It'll be people versus history. And um, I don't have the answers, but I'm, you're right to raise it. It's a key issue. I'm sorry, but we've actually run out of time. Um, no. So it's been fabulous because uh, you have had really great questions. Um, Rick is going to be around the building today. Um, and I really want to thank you all for coming, for being so thoughtful. And I really want to thank Rick. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much.